As human populations have increased in the coastal regions, we've seen an increasing impact from human activities in coastal waters. A lot of the problem on Cape Cod is we're putting too much nitrogen into the coastal waters. As this nitrogen enters the landscape from your septic fields, from a wastewater treatment plant, from the fertilizer you put on your lawn, from the golf course next door, it is quickly mobilized in the form of something we call nitrate through the groundwater system and ultimately ends up in the coastal ocean. Once that nitrogen hits the coastal ocean and comes back out into the waters, just as it stimulated the plant growth on your lawn, it will stimulate the plant growth in the coastal waters. Plants in the coastal waters are small microscopic organisms, but you've seen them. If you've driven by a water body that's impacted by excess nitrogen, you've seen that green coloration. Plants in general are not a bad thing, but as we get these blooms of plants, this excess growth of plants, many detrimental effects can occur. When these plants die off, as they do naturally, they're going to start falling to the sediment and being consumed by other organisms in the water column. This consumption will consume the oxygen in the water column, and we can get hypoxic or anoxic events. Hypoxic are low oxygen levels where we start to see things like fish move out of the ecosystem. Anoxic systems are systems that are devoid of oxygen, they have no oxygen, and therefore very little of our macroscopic life that we're familiar with survive. Oysters can be part of the solution because when excess nitrogen enters coastal waters, it fuels the growth of microorganisms that can utilize this nitrogen for their own growth. And this often creates huge blooms of microbes that make coastal waters cloudy. Uh, oysters are really efficient filter feeders on such plankton, and by consuming large fractions of this plankton, they can convert that nitrogen stored in the, in the bloom organisms to oyster biomass, okay, to oyster tissue. So when the oysters are removed from the ecosystem uh, for human consumption uh, by the farmers or by, by uh, community shellfishers, uh, this uh, removes the nitrogen stored in the oyster biomass from the ecosystem. In addition, the portion of the nitrogen <clears throat> that the oysters did not convert to oyster tissue is released to the sediments below the oysters in the form of feces and pseudofeces, and this organic material is used by naturally occurring microbes in marine sediments. Some of those microbes can use this organic material to conduct processes for growth that release nitrogen gas. This nitro nitrogen gas is released into the atmosphere and 70% of the air we breathe is nitrogen gas. This is harmless to humans and it removes this nitrogen from the ecosystem. With the interest in using oysters as a way to remediate nitrogen addition in the coastal waters, one step has been missing. No one's really looked at how different methods result in different nitrogen removal rates. That's what we're going to do in this study. We chose the three most commonly used aquaculture methods on Cape Cod. Floating bags, oyster grow, midwater cages, and bottom sitting cages. And we're monitoring how nitrogen is removed from the sediments below and what changes we can see in the microbial community. With this knowledge, we can then make recommendations for how to best do this. And so decision makers, town managers, private growers can choose the system that will be most effective for their situation. You know, the marine waters of Cape Cod are sort of like part of the lifeblood of the region. Just the culture of shellfishing on Cape Cod, um, eating shellfish, this is also part of how it sort of fits in to this, the community legacy. And so um, there's a connection between what's happening in the environment and what's happening in the economy of our communities.
It's what helps to drive the tourism economy. It's why people come here and visit. It's why they love the beaches. There's also a connection between people who have lived here year round and have seen a decline in their backyard. Given that this has become such a pressing problem, now we've turned our attention to not just describing the problem, we're trying to figure out how do we solve it. Um, and solving it is going to be an expensive matter. And so many communities are really interested in looking at the role that shellfish aquaculture can play because the organisms can help to filter out pollutants and help clean up the water. It's also um, something that residents are really interested in. They want to know what can be done to solve the problem without it being um, super expensive and unaffordable. Um, so part of it is finding cost-effective solutions that will work. What we're trying to really understand is where is it most appropriate to use this particular option to address our water quality problems because it's not going to solve everything we need to happen, but it definitely is going to be a part of the solution. Nitrogen enters coastal waters from many different sources. One of the primary sources is through leaching of nitrogen in septics uh, from household septic systems in coastal zones, uh, which travels through the groundwater into our coastal waters. What we do in the coastal terrain directly impacts the water quality of our coastal zone uh, due to these tight land water connections that exist and what we do around our homes in coastal areas really, really matters. If we enter the nitrogen cycle at the level of organic material, either cell material from the phytoplankton or the oyster or excreted material from the oyster or other things living in the water column, we're entering the nitrogen cycle at our most reduced state. We'll call this ammonia. Now there are bacteria in the water column, in the sands around your house, that can very quickly use this ammonium with oxygen, in the presence of oxygen, to produce nitrate. And in doing so, they are harvesting the energy of that transformation for their own cellular processes. Oysters can take up the plants that grow off of this nitrate in the water column. And they can do two things with this. They can add it to their own biomass, the same way we add our food materials to our own biomass. The other thing they can do is because of the way they feed, they take in all the cells around them as a filter feeder, and they sort the cells they want to eat on their gill. The cells they do not want to eat, they package into something called a pseudofeces. It's a dense packet of cellular material. They excrete that, and because it is a dense, small packet of cells, it sinks very quickly to the sediments. This is a very important transport of material from the water column to the sediments. In the sediments, something different happens chemically. We talked about nitrogen being transformed from an ammonium state to a nitrate state in the presence of oxygen, and that nitrate being stable. But once you lose oxygen, which is a natural occurrence in the sediments, a different set of microbial processes will take place. There are three processes which we will talk about. All these processes reduce that nitrate back to a more reduced nitrogen compound. The first process we'll talk about is called denitrification. This is a process in which bacteria are able to breathe nitrate the way you and I breathe oxygen to burn their food source. As a result, as you and I breathe out CO2, these bacteria can breathe out either nitrite or they might take it all the way to dinitrogen gas. Dinitrogen gas is the end goal we want for this remediation process because that's the same nitrogen we have in the atmosphere all around us. The second process is a somewhat competing process with denitrification, but it competes at the nitrite level. Nitrite levels are not high in the environment, but that doesn't mean that the nitrate is not available. It's just moved through very quickly. This process is called anamox. Anamox combines some reduced nitrogen in the form of ammonia 
so what's raining down from the oysters with the nitrite that's available from the partial respiration of the organic, organic material. It too will produce um, dinitrogen gas and the organisms that do this will harvest the energy for cellular processes. The third process is called disinflammatory reduction of nitrate to ammonia. This competes with denitrification for that nitrate source. And what these organisms do is they convert the nitrate back to ammonium in an anaerobic setting, in a setting without oxygen. This does not remove nitrogen from the system, it just moves it to a different pool. That nitrogen is still stuck in the sediment column, at least temporarily. It is not removing nitrogen to gaseous nitrogen, but it's an important process that we must consider. As oysters process the plant material in, in the water column, and they excrete organic nitrogen, or they produce these pseudofeces and shuttle organic material to the sediments into the anaerobic zone, where bacteria can take over and remineralize this nitrogen back to gaseous nitrogen. We want to understand how these three systems affect the net nitrogen removal and by which of these three processes they might be doing it. What is actually happening when you have like an oyster culture site is that of course you can mediate, you can help nitrogen removal from the ecosystem because we are actually, what we are doing is you have an organism that requires to grow and because it needs to grow it has to take nutrients, right? So these nutrients are, can be incorporated in the biomass, meaning in the, in, the, in the oyster itself as the organism. So by harvesting the oyster you are actually harvesting the nutrients that they are inside the water. However, if you have an oyster culture site, even after you remove the oysters, it's like you trained your bacteria that they are in the sediments to work faster when they see nitrate, nitrates coming. So this effect is a long-term effect because it doesn't have, it is, let's say it's triggered from the oysters, but it can continue happening after you remove the oysters from the site. For this project, we selected three different types of growing methods. These methods were selected because they are three of the most popular growing methods in the Northeast. The reason we selected these three different types were for various physical considerations in our growing area. These include bathymetry or the depth of the water in your area, the biological makeup of where we're working, the aesthetics of the area, which is what it looks like to your neighbors, and how much we wish to have our gear either on the bottom, on the surface, or in the middle of the water column. These are the three different types of growing systems. First, we have the floating bags. These bags sit on the surface and have flotation on both sides, and oysters grow within the bags. Second, we have bottom condos. These bottom condos work with the similar type bags. However, these condos sit on the bottom and the bags are elevated just off the bottom. Third, we have our midwater oyster grows. As indicated by their name, these oysters grow in the middle or near the surface of the water column, however, not on the surface. These also hold similar bags to the other systems. When selecting an area for your farm, there are a number of considerations. Included in these considerations are your location that you wish to grow. The location selection needs to include an area that you and your employees will be able to access to tend your gear. These are floating bags. These are the lightest of all the systems. These bags easily come apart, the tops remove, and shellfish are able to be placed inside the bag for growth. Each bag has a clip end and a loop end, 
The clip end from one bag attaches to the loop end of the next bag to form a string of bags. Strings of bags are attached into buoyed main lines, which rise and fall with the tide. To perform maintenance, the bags are flipped over such that each previously submerged side of each bag is out of the water. The floating bag system can be installed in many physical environments, as water depth and substrate composition are not primary considerations for installation. Because the floating bag system does not utilize gear in contact with the substrate, it may be more desirable for permitting. Installation and maintenance on this system is the least labor-intensive and time-consuming. Floating bags are the least expensive growing method of the systems utilized in this study. In the floating bag system, all gear is visible on the surface, which may not be a desired aesthetic. The floating bag system is vulnerable to damage from high-velocity environments, including storms and high winds. This system is also labor-intensive to build and there are currently no ready-made options for purchase. Floating bags have their advantages and disadvantages, and they are one of the systems that we used in our study. Now let's talk about the bottom condos. The bottom condos hold six or in some cases nine individual bags. These actually do not sit like this in the water. They sit on these individual feet. Let's lay them down so you can see how they sit on the bottom. The bottom condo system is made of a wire cage enclosure arranged with compartments for individual oyster bags. The bags are secured within the compartments by elastics and clips. Each condo has three six inch tall legs attached to the bottom to keep the system lying in a flat orientation with the compartments just above the substrate. To perform maintenance, bags are removed from the condo compartments, scrubbed of fouling agents and debris, flipped over, and replaced within the condo compartments. Installation, maintenance, and costs of bottom condos fall in the middle compared to other systems utilized in this study. Ready-made options of this system are available for purchase. In the bottom condo system, all gear is hidden beneath the water, providing no change in what is visible within the natural environment. This aesthetic may be desirable. Bottom condos are resilient to storm damage due to their position in the water column. Because all gear is below the water, the system needs to be clearly marked so as not to be a navigational hazard. Bottom condos must be installed in an area with firm substrate. Additional physical site considerations for this system include water depth and tide for maintenance access. Here are the midwater oyster grows. These grows also hold either six or nine bags. On the tops of these systems, when they sit in the water, are flotation to allow the system to be suspended off the bottom. The individual bags are held in the system behind a door. Some people get confused and think that the floats are located on the bottom of the system. When these systems are filled with oysters, the floats actually sit on the surface, on the top. This is how they sit in the water. To perform maintenance, the oyster grow is flipped, so that flotation is on the surface of the water and cage compartments are out of the water. Bags are then removed from the condo compartments, scrubbed of fouling agents and debris, flipped over, and replaced within the condo compartments. Finally, the cage is replaced, suspended in the water column. In the midwater oyster grow system, most gear is hidden beneath the water, providing little change to the aesthetic of the natural environment. Because the oyster grow system does not utilize gear in contact with the substrate, it may be more desirable for permitting. Ready-made options of this system are available for purchase.
Oyster grows must be installed in an area with a minimum water depth to suspend the cage structure, keeping the system above the substrate on low tides. A series of oyster grows can be vulnerable to damage from high velocity environments, including storms with high winds. Maintenance on this system is the most labor intensive and time consuming of the systems utilized in this study, with the larger and heavier oysters being more cumbersome to tend. Oyster grows are the most expensive growing method of the systems utilized in this study. The goal of this study was to examine how three commonly used aquaculture systems affect sediment denitrification and the sediments that underlie these systems. We used bottom cages, floating bags, and oyster grow midwater systems to grow oysters all in the same hydrodynamic regime. The main difference between these systems is how close the oysters are to the sediments with the idea that oysters being closer to the sediments will be more efficient at exporting materials to the sediments that may then stimulate nitrogen removal. What we observed over the course of the growing season under, at our study site was an increase in the re release of nitrogen gas uh, from sediments underlying all three of our oyster gear types uh, relative to our control site. And this increase was two to three or more times higher than background um, over the season and increased over the season. And we think that this is driven uh, by the increased inputs of organic material to the underlying sediments that fuel processes responsible for this release of, of nitrogen gas. And our observations of increased production of nitrogen gas uh, are consistent with what we saw in the uh, molecular data when we looked at the pool of RNA uh, extracted from the same sediments. And RNA is a molecule that tells us what genes are being expressed. And expression of a gene is the first step an organism takes towards that process. So if you detect expression of a particular gene, uh, as we did detect increased expression of genes involved, for instance, in the pathway for denitrification and for, uh, and to a lesser extent, the, uh, the process of anaerobic ammonia oxidation, or what's called anamox. Uh, if, you, if you detect this increased expression, that's an indication that the organisms are ramping up these processes, and this is consistent uh, with what we saw in the evolution of nitrogen gas. It's important to note that our data allows us to estimate the amount of added nitrogen that can be removed uh, via uh, microbial processes in the sediments. Um, but um, our data are, is only for the growing season um, at our farm site. So our projections are based just on the time frame when the oysters are installed at the site. But the biodeposits, the, the feces and pseudofeces, the organic material that accumulates under these farms, uh, some of it remains after the aquaculture site is removed at the end of the growing season. And so the benefits may be actually slightly greater than what we are projecting because these inputs continue to stimulate these processes for an un, 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 unknown amount of time into the fall and perhaps the winter. As the, as the aquaculture season progressed, we also started to notice expression of genes for uh, processes that may compete with the beneficial processes that we're interested in, like denitrification and anamox we saw increased expression of genes for processes that may compete with those processes for the nitrate, uh, that may actually um, depress the possible gains that one might get by having an aquaculture uh, site in place. And one of these processes is uh, DNRA, or 
uh, dissimilatory nitrate reduction to ammonia. And this process effectively retains nitrogen in the system in the form of ammonia instead of releasing it as nitrogen gas. So uh, we saw this particularly under our bottom cage equipment uh, toward the end of our growing season. And so the take home from this is that uh, if we are interested in, in uh, realizing gains in nitrogen removal with our aquaculture system, then we should pay attention to what's going on in the sediments under these uh, sites, particularly with the bottom cage gear, because we may start to favor some of these other processes that may uh, depress the possible gains that you can see. Um, that said, even under the bottom cages, uh, nitrogen production increased steadily over the aquaculture system, uh, season. Um, but it may actually have been greater had uh, DNRA not been a process that became active. It is important to have in mind that uh, all the all the all the chemical cycles that they happen they happen in the sediments they are not independent. They usually one can influence another one, or they can cross talk, or they can they can have anyway they can have a common ground. So this is important also in oyster cultures because the nitrogen removal process and the nitrogen cycle is very much affected from the presence of sulfur cycle also in the sediments. That said, when you have, when the, when uh, the amount of organic matter or uh, the amount of nutrients increase in a sediment, the possibility of ending up with anoxic conditions, meaning no oxygen at all, or conditions that they, they, they can lead you to slightly acidic situations like hydrogen sulfide being present in the sediment. This is something that can actually can have an immediate effect on the processes of nitrogen removal processes in the sediments. The presence of, um, of hydrogen sulfide in the sediment, what it creates is benefits nitrogen retention process, meaning that instead of removing nitrogen with via aquaculture, you can actually go to the completely opposite way, like retaining uh, nitrogen in the ecosystem. So that's the reason why we have to be really careful in, this, uh, in these cases. So, presence of hydrogen sulfide can be, can cause, can, can create a, a big cost, let's say, in the, in the nitrogen removal underneath the sediment. What we actually saw, that it was really interesting in terms of, uh, of processes, is that the floating type gears that we used, the floating bags in the oyster grow, that means, Efficiently, they were providing oxygen, they were circulated oxygen in the sediments underneath the, underneath the treatment, which means that eliminated the possibility of have strictly anaerobic conditions and, th and, and hence presence of hydrogen sulfide in high uh, levels that can create any problem with uh, nitrogen removal processes. So this was very, for us, this was very interesting because we observed this, uh, let's say, phenomenon for two sequential years. So. These processes not only promoted nitrogen removal from the, uh, from the sediments underneath the, the oyster treatments, but also stopped, arrested any possible uh, um, nitrogen retention process because they actually they eliminated the possibility of hydrogen sulfide accumulating under, under, uh, under the treatments. Given the three different gear types that we have, the floating bag on the surface of the water column, the oyster grow, which is floating down in the middle of the water column, and the bottom cages, which are sitting on top of the sediments. We might see different geochemistries in the sediments below. We believe that because of the added, the difference in the added organic matter between the three systems, we can push the geochemistry to either favor denitrification or favor DNRA, which will compete with denitrification and ultimately lower your net nitrogen removal rates. In instances where we have excessive organic material hitting the bottom sediments, that can in turn generate excessive sulfide. Sulfide production favors the process of DNRA, moving nitrate back to the ammonium pool rather than nitrate to the dinitrogen pool. In this case, the environment will tend to accumulate the nitrogen, at least temporarily, rather than remove it to the atmosphere.
because the bottom cages are so close to the sediments, in fact, right on top of the sediments, they more efficiently move organic matter from the water column into the sediment column. The floating bags in the midwater oyster growth systems are higher up in the water column and there's less efficient export of organic, of organic material through that water column to the sediments. Because it can be moved by currents, other activities can happen in the water column and so the net result is less organic matter to the sediments. By pushing less organic matter to the sediments, we will also generate less sulfide production. And so we think that these systems may favor denitrification over DNRA in this setting. In our study, all three systems enhance the removal of nitrogen from the ecosystem. However, given the proximity to the sediments of the bottom cages, we think that the bottom cages can export more organic matter to the sediments. This can lead to the buildup of sulfide in the sediments and may change the processes that are active in the sediments in favor of DNRA over denitrification. Therefore, in this site, we think that the floating bags in the midwater oyster growth systems favor denitrification over the bottom cages, unless these systems are rotated. If we rotate these systems, we can limit that push to the DNA system and we can preserve denitrification removing more nitrogen. To extend this study to other estuaries, you would want to consider what the organic content of the sediment you're putting your systems in and what their sulfide content is also. Again, additional sulfide may push the system to DNRA over denitrification, which is not what we want for remediation purposes. We would also want to monitor organic matter retention and sulfide generation in the sediments as we're growing our oysters in these systems. Prior to selecting an aquaculture site, we would want to get initial measurements of organic matter material and sulfide, hydrogen sulfide, in the sediment column. We would also want to monitor organic matter accumulation and sulfide accumulation in the system as the oysters are grown. These numbers will help us decide whether or not the results of this study are extended to your system of interest. If sulfide gets too high, we may be pushing our system away from nitrogen removal and more towards nitrogen retention. So to extend the, the results or our, the findings from our study to a new aquaculture site, uh, as, as Dan mentioned, it's important to gather some information about your, uh, your site. And this includes an assessment of the organic content of your sediments as well as the starting sulfide levels. And then to monitor that organic accumulation and, sul and those sulfide levels uh, over the growing season at least once or twice to be able to tell whether the result, whether you are going to obtain a similar gains in terms of nitrogen removal as we did from the Wakoit Bay site. Uh, we'd like to point out that these measurements of total organic material and sulfide are easy to make, uh, requiring a, uh, a grower to simply collect sediments into a gas-tight bottle and to pass them off to any number of local laboratories. If your aquaculture site is similar to Wakoit Bay in terms of hydrographic regime, organic matter content, and hydrogen sulfide in the sediment, Floating bags or the midwater oyster growth systems would be the preferred aquaculture system, especially if your goal is to meet your TMDL limits. Mm -hmm.